music um, that you've been listening to is Jem Finer's Long Player. The Long Player was commissioned and produced to mark the millennium by Art Angel. And on the 31st of December, at precisely noon, it will be 13 years age. It will have finally reached its adolescence. When it was only five, we initiated something called the Art Angel Long Player Conversations. The idea was simple, that two people who were familiar with each other's work, but didn't really know each other, would be invited to come together without preparing or scripting a dialogue and have a conversation, get to know one another, be curious about what makes the other tick. And in a rather unpredictable way, rather like you don't know what's gonna come next with Long Player because it's a generative composition. These uh, Long Player conversations were initiated in 2005 uh, by Laurie Anderson and Doris Lessing. Um, other pairings have included George Soros and Alain de Botton, uh, Bruce Mao and David Ajay, and last year, on this very stage, uh, James Lovelock and John Gray. Uh, the conversations are really about asking each other questions and answering them, and for that reason, in some years, we don't have a Q&A after the conversation, and tonight's gonna be one such occasion. Uh, Catelyn Moran was born in Wolverhampton. At the age of 15, she won the Observer Young Reporter of the Year and then went into music journalism, first at The Melody Maker and then memorably on the TV program Naked City, where amongst other achievements, she persuaded U2 to make a pop video in her bedroom uh, and uh, introduced Bjork to the joys of pop noodle. At the age of 18, she became a columnist for The Times, where she remains. Last year, she published the hugely successful multi-award winning How to Be a Woman, and this year followed it up with more anthology, which was about topics that range from the big society to big hair. John Lanchester was born in Hamburg, grew up in India and Hong Kong, and has written about football and food and death and debt. His first novel, The Debt to Pleasure, won the Whitbread best novel of the year for first novels. Uh, he's a regular contributor to the London Review of Books and to the New Yorker. Uh, last year, in researching his novel, which was published this year called Capital, uh, he wrote a book called Whoops, or if you're watching this stream in America, I O U, Why Everyone Owes Everyone and No One Can Pay, which was the, the only book I've uh, read that actually made me understand what's going on uh, in the world of uh, finance. Um, so I'd like you all warmly to welcome John Lanchester and Catelyn Moran. Hello. Thank you. Two drinks. I reckon it's a two-drink job. That's my plan. Um, this is fancy, isn't it, Reba? Didn't realise it was going to be so fancy and posh. Glad I made an effort. <laughs> You're laughing. This is actually my funeral shirt. This is my best shirt. This is the one I wear to, uh, to posh occasions. Um, we've already started talking already, haven't we? We've we kind have. Of... And the first, the first thing, and non-trivial thing, was the pronunciation of your first name. Yes. Catelyn. Catelyn. Yes. It, it was a, uh, yes, no, I mean, I, I do heartily regret it now. I think if I could go back in time, I wouldn't change my name. Um, but I was, this was during the, uh, when I was 13, I went through a brief period of thinking that maybe my master was Satan, um, or that generally the way forward in life would be to, uh, to uh, get in league with the dark forces, um, because I was reading the occult section of our local library at that point. I'd already read all the agriculture and moved on to the occult. And uh, there was a book there. They're not next door to each other, so there's no... No, 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 but I like to pinball yeah. randomly around. Um, and uh, also, I mean, that was just working a sweet spot in the back of the library where she couldn't see me stealing things. So I was kind of, I uh, homed in on that bit. And uh, yeah, no, I just read a numerology book that said, because uh, my real name's Catherine, uh, that that was an unlucky name and would not lead to success or love. And uh, that I would need to change it to a name that had this amount of letters in it. So, um, so I changed it. But it's really annoying because no one ever pronounces it correctly, and neither should they, uh, because that's not how anybody else who spells it like that would pronounce it. And I, I can remember when Susan Sarandon suddenly started going, no, you pronounce it Susan Sarandon, yeah. and being really annoyed to go, no, you don't. Um, and I feel like that about myself now. Yeah. <laughs> well, th th there is that thing if you have a... But I, my name has a DNA fault in, in... 
Lanchester comes out 19 times out of 20. It's like restaurant, hotel, airplane booking, everything. Lancaster. Yes. And do you feel, have you ever wondered who John Lancaster would be? Do you think he would be different? No, but I think one odd thing about him though, it's like, and that was sort of both funny and embarrassing was I got cyber squatted. But this guy who went around buying up, he clearly thought that Oh, that's not where a robot sits on you. Okay. No, 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 sorry, no, no it's exactly. And there's no, there's no filth component to it. <laughs> um, uh, you know, he bought up lots of writers' domain names. Yes. Uh, thinking that he was going to make a packet out of, you know, JulianBarnes.com, etc. And, and he bought mine, but he bought John Lancaster first. <laughs> so this complete fucker who was, you know, trying to rip me off. Even he ripped off John Lancaster first. <laughs> I love the that of all the people that he decided he was going to rip off. It was authors who generally yeah, exactly. kind of like, yeah. They'll be the ones that are in there with the website. It's kind of like, yeah, not Toys R Us. It's yeah. kind of like, yeah, as soon as you're sitting there all day and typing, he's the one that'll be first in there with a like, domain name. Yes, it's like, uh, I've got a guy who's a medievalist and he has a T-shirt that says, I study medieval literature because that's where the money is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I would like to have that T-shirt first. Look what I've got. Oh, yes, uh, Captain's showing this off. Can, can anyone see what she's got there? A blue Peter bat, yeah. Hands up if you want one. No. I can't believe how many people don't want one. Can I, can, can I just ask that again? Who really wants a blue Peter bat in their heart and who's always wanted one since they were a child? It's, it's still a depressingly small amount. The, other, the others have already got them. Maybe, is that, oh, okay, yes. How many of you do already have one? I'm liking the amount of swats in the audience. This is really good. Well, this is, this, to me, this is like casually wearing an Oscar. This is what I'm basically doing here, I'm very casually displaying this. Um, uh, since the age of 10, I, I can name every single competition on Blue Peter that I wanted to win and didn't. Uh, they, uh, when uh, uh, York Minster burnt down, and uh, they replaced, or had some kind of fire in it, didn't it? And they replaced the bosses on the ceiling, and they get, had a competition for children to design a boss on the ceiling. Convinced I'd won that, didn't. Um, they did um, some kind of garden in Liverpool uh, to commemorate some kind of anniversary and stuff. Convinced I'd won that, didn't. To the point where they were about to announce the winners and I was just so sure they were going to say my name and then they opened the door and the girl came on stage. It was like, she's known for weeks. Yeah. I've been sitting there waiting for this to be announced. Um, so you know, so this is, so they asked me to be the judge of the Blue Peter Book Awards last week and I accepted simply in order to get this badge. Can you hear when I go like that? Is that quiet over there and then okay there? I can hear. You can hear it here? <laughs> You're 37 years too late with that comment. <laughs> Ain't gonna stop now. I might just take this t-shirt with me when I move over here and then back again. Look, that's casual, isn't it? That's, that's good. That's very casual. Yeah, no, that's that good. works. Yes. Yeah. How many books did you have to read? Oh, God, millions. Um, uh, literature's going through, children's literature's going through a massive phase at the moment um, of uh, basically being sub Harry Potter. Yeah. Um, so yes, it's all about children who are hated by their parents and or adopted aunts and uncles. And then there's a knock at the door and someone with a strange look about them yeah. inducts them into a secret world and off they go. Um, so yeah, basically the only book... Oh no, I can't say who won. No, stop there. Okay. <laughs> to let that go there. This is, you can't hear it when it's like that, can you? <laughs> no, that is a definite... Okay, right. I'm going to put this onto my beard. Oh, I don't have a beard, do I? So that's where I've gone wrong. Can I clip it to my hair? Would that work? Oh, you know what? I'll just hold it. There you go. I'm going to pretend to be Terry Wogan on Blankety Blank with a very tiny microphone. <laughs> That's good. Yes. That's nice and casual. Jesus. Oh, okay. um, but, yes. Well, we were talking beforehand about, um, about the idea behind, behind this, the, uh, the piece of music that lasts a thousand years. Yes. And... <laughs> And that That's really that rude, came, I'm sorry. That came up. Yes. Uh, and uh, you slightly answered the question, which was, is that a thing you ever think about, those very long time frames? Well, I only found out that that was why we were gathered here today, um, yesterday, when, because I'm a vain person, um, I have a Google alert set up about me. And um, at about six o'clock last night, as I was finishing off a piece, um, a Google alert dropped in telling me where I was today and that it would be streamed by The Guardian and, uh, and saying that we had gathered together to uh, discuss this um, thousand-year-long piece of music that started broadcasting in uh, October 2007 and would be going on for another thousand years. And um, I was very alarmed because I just thought, I don't know if I can discuss that. Um, and I gave it my best shot, and I fast-forwarded through a few bits, but I regret to say that I've only got to about January 2009 and have <laughs> not listened to all of it so far. But um, 
I'm hoping the beats are going to come in soon, I've got to say. I'm hoping it's like one of those really long intros, like one of those 12-inch remixes of Blue Monday that go on for a very long time. Yeah. And then suddenly it's going to go... No, apparently they are planning a disco version. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, don't cough into the microphone. Now, tell me what you think about this. Well, I, I was thinking about it in, in relation to your book, because the first book, How to Be a Woman, you have that very striking thing about... You say that the biggest philosophical problem in the world is people thinking there's an afterlife. Yes. Because um, if you knew you were absolutely going to die and that was the end of it, then you just wouldn't be as much of a bastard when you're alive. I think that kind of vague feeling that you can sort it all out in the afterlife. Or the people will really understand you in the afterlife. And that kind of maybe you don't have to explain yourself now. Or just this sort of vague feeling of just this kind of absolutely existential manana. It'll all get sorted out at some point, whereas if you knew you, this was it, then you would be dead in 60 or 70, 80 years. Um, then I think you'd just, A, be more polite, uh, but you'd crack on with stuff. Um, yes, so I think that's, that's the key thing. I think the one thing that would make this world a better place is if everybody did know they were going to die and didn't believe in an afterlife at all. Uh, I, and because I was thinking about this event while I was reading that, it's a really striking idea that, that there's something morally corrupting about the idea of an afterlife. And I was yes. wondering if... You know, the idea of a thousand year time frame is kind of the opposite, that you have to start thinking about what you'd like the world to be like when, you know, really a long time after none of us is around. How would you like it to be? Like Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> what, just with the noise that doors make when they close? Or yeah, and the beaming, beaming up and down without, you know, without having all the crap at airports. And Not so. commuting, would that be your main Not thing? Not commuting. Um, Commuting is actually a really big thing in happiness studies. You know, they have all that stuff about what makes people happier in their, in their daily lives. And almost everything that people think will make them happier is rubbish. Yes. Uh, particularly things to do with increased income. You know, and there's this thing called the hedonic treadmill, that having something slightly nicer, you very quickly... You know, Monday, it seems like... A, it's like bankers and bonuses. You tell them on Monday they're going to get a million quid. Yes. They go, oh, well, great. By Wednesday, it's, oh, it's completely normal, a million quid. And by Friday, they're, they're feeling angry and resentful because they're not getting two million quid. <laughs> and that's the hedonic treadmill. Everything gets normalized. And so almost nothing that people think will make them happy makes them happy. And one of the only things that doesn't is, is stopping commuting. People are actually genuinely, measurably happier if they don't commute. <laughs> I don't think anyone... It was funny, I was lying in bed last night after I realised that this was quite an intellectual conversation and that, I, that my planned massive digression about how I nearly had sex with Jedward last week probably <laughs> wouldn't be the time or the place. Um, we can rewind to that. We must come back to it, though. I mean, it is a good one, and I nearly did. Um, <laughs> but children's BAFTAs, I'm telling you, that place is a flesh pot. It's, it's, <laughs> the shit goes down. I was on Blue Peter's table, those people can drink. Which is apparently the maddest gig in the history of show business in terms of drug abuse, polymorphous perversity, everyone going completely sex and booze and drug mad all the time, was the Muppets. Yes, well, there was that amazing, um, I'm sure, apocryphal story about how when they brought the Muppets over from California to London, because that's where they were shooting, um, that each of the Muppets' heads had a different drug in it. So <laughs> Fozzy was the hash, I think Gonzo was the acid, and kind of that was... I'm sure apoph apocryphal, but, um, but really? no, I can imagine. I'd always heard it was Tiswas. Oh, really? But yeah, there was a, I've, I've heard, you probably don't like to say this, I was on the internet, we better not, I'll tell oh. you later. Okay. It's, that's the part of the conversation we can't do, but there's an amazing story about Chris Tarrant. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> yes. Okay. I'll tell you all later, when The Guardian have gone. <laughs> uh, no, do you think it was like this when Doris Lessing was doing this? I don't think it was, was it? <laughs> I'll tell you all about the bombing later, when The Guardian have gone. Yes. I put cash money on her not having had a three-way with Jedward. No, and maybe that's where she went wrong. Yeah. Maybe that's where I went wrong, because I didn't. Anyway, so yes, what we're talking about. So, no, deep thoughts, and I was lying in bed thinking, if I had to say something deeper, I was like, kind of, if a curveball came up and we had to discuss about how what we would do if we ruled the world, what I think would generally change things, and it is not commuting, because there's so many reasons why it's shit. First of all, pollution. 
kind of, you know, the traffic jams, the whole city's coming to gridlock, um, the amount of time that, you know, spending like, you know, in London, it's kind of an hour-long commute is average. That's two hours in a day. Those are the two hours that you would be best spent and exercising for an hour of that and spending that other end, uh, hour with your children or having sex or all those things on lists that people don't get the time and chance to do anymore. Being at home, I think, is um, often better for you than being out with people. This whole idea of kind of being socialised, I think, I mean, I would say this because I was home educated and I know work from home, but I think this whole idea of socialising is massively overrated in many ways. I suspect that more than half of the prescriptions of Valium and half the instances of alcoholism in this world are just people trying to deal with the idiots at the office that they hate. <laughs> I judge this from conversations I've had with my friends, just the kind of, when my husband used to work in an office, he'd come back and he'd like, he'd, you know, he'd have maybe, I don't know, written 1,500 words and I'd done 4,000. And I'd be like, why haven't you done it? He was like, well, they brought out a new kind of crisp today and <laughs> whole office ground to a halt and we had to do crisp Olympics and, uh, <laughs> and that went on, that was good. And then that, that smelly man came and sat next to me and talked to me and that was bad. And then someone was having some kind of, epic marital breakdown, I had to talk to them about that for three hours. I don't even like her, but I had to talk to her about it. And just the amount of time wasted just dealing with an office but environment. But that's the thing, I'm, when I, I worked, I had a proper job for about 10 years before I started writing full time. I worked as an editor. And the thing I most missed about stopping doing, the thing I most missed about stopping working was, was not working. Yes. Because you still get paid anyway. You yes. Know, and you're sort of, you know, hung over or in the throes of an unhappy love affair or just simply can't be asked. You can just sort of fake your way through a day and go home and it's all fine. Whereas when you've when you got a piece to write or a book to write, you know, you don't do it, you haven't done it. Yeah, you can't ring in sick to yourself, I'm not very well today. <laughs> yes, you are me. <laughs> Get on with it. You can't do that at home, can you? No, no, I miss that. So what, would you, what, what, would you, what were your big time-wasting things then? Would you, I mean, did you start writing when you were in a proper job? Kind yeah, of? in parallel. Most people write their first books while they're doing something else. Yes. In, that's in... Uh, uh, so, yeah, no, I, I, was, I was an editor, but, but um, proofreading is absolutely fantastic for not working because you can just sit there with the proof in front of you. You're just sort of looking at it, and everyone thinks you're working. <laughs> and, you know, you know, you're just regretting that, uh, you know, onion bhaji you had last night <laughs> at length. Were there any good bits about going to work? I mean, do you miss socialising? Because it can be a lonely I, thing, can't it? I mean, it that's can. why. But, I, I, you know, I don't mind the... I, I don't mind the uh, the lonely side of writing. Um, and I suspect you don't either. No. You know, the ice, I quite like the thing that it's just me. It's, you know, it's my day, it's my time, it's my work. I like all that. I, I, I slightly miss the texture of relationship that you have with colleagues. What, that kind of grimly resentful and hatred? <laughs> part, partly that. Um, yes. But slightly sexual and flirty? No, it's more that you have things in common, you can have a lot in common without necessarily having anything in common. Yeah. That there's a kind of joint purpose to it, if, especially if you're getting out a magazine. Yes. You're busy, you've got to get the bloody thing out. Um, and that sort of sense of a collective focus. I, I did miss that. Yeah, having a sense of bristling purpose is kind of hard to have when you're at home in your pyjamas, eating sardines out of a can with your fingers, kind of, which is the my general writing state. What, what do you do when you write? Do you get dressed? Uh, yeah, because we've got kids, so... <laughs> <Am I? laughs> no, 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 when you, I don't mean naked, but like when the first time I went to the Writers Guild Awards, Amanda Yanucci gave a brilliant introduction speech where he went, it's amazing to see a room full of writers all dressed and not just in dressing gowns. It's obviously the first time you've not been out of your dressing gowns in the last year, so... Yeah, no, I mean, not very, um, not poshly, but yeah, no, I do wear clothes. Um, it's, I quite like, I quite like... I had a friend who used to say that the only way of watching football, especially if it was a cup final, was completely naked and on your own. <laughs> and there's something in that that you can sort of, there's an absolute purity, because you, when you're really watching the game, you are really watching the game. Did he explain why? I mean, was this so that it could lead focus, on to other things? Or really? Yeah. Are you more focused naked watching Yeah, television? because there's, by definition, there's no one else there. As a TV critic, maybe I should try this, because I keep missing massive plot points in Game of Thrones. Maybe I should just stop watching it in the knack. You could try that. <laughs> we were talking before about... Um, we sort of briefly talked about this, because we'd had 20 minutes of pre-chat before we came in, and uh, talking about the idea of how you can write about things too much, and yeah. it, it sort of takes the flavour out of it and takes the love out of it. And you were saying yeah. you'd had that with football. Yeah, I did burn out about it. Um, you know, I was a sort of obsessive, uh, geeky, uh, you know, passionate football fan, that's what I used to do with my weekends, and then shaded into writing about it, writing match reports. And um, have you ever done that? Have you ever done a... I, they made me go and report on a football match once, and it was 
Manchester United versus someone in the south of the city, whatever that would be. And I got there and had very, very bad cystitis. Right. And, and, uh, and, uh, and the press room of a football pitch is, uh, is yeah. not the best place to be a woman. They don't have amazing female toilet facilities. So, yeah. And I, I'd not really got... I didn't... Because <laughs> I've only ever seen it on telly. So every time they scored a goal, I was looking the other way. And there was no yeah. replay. It was just kind of like, was that it? Yeah. I'm just... The goal happens in one second and it's over. You know, they make a real meal of it when it's on yeah, telly. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I didn't. Me and my urethra did not find the uh, <laughs> not find the experience edifying. No, well, uh, all of that minus the cystitis is pretty much <laughs> the way it usually is. And, yes. Um, <laughs> and, it, and it's and the, and it's a consensus reality because you usually, you often miss the goal because you have to start writing it at half time because most of the second half you you do. And I, I did it in the days before laptops, but you're writing so goes in, you look up, you're lucky if you watch it, if you, if you catch it, and everyone asks each other, oh, look, so I missed that, who was it? Yeah. And then you, you know, agree who scored the goal, Bloody and agree hell. what the timing was, and yeah. then if you watch it that evening, really, I mean, I think they have more replays now, but back then, you, I'd, I'd be wrong about half the time. It's really embarrassing. People aren't shy about pointing it out. No, I can imagine. Um, and you had 15 minutes from the end of the game to file the piece, which is why you had to start writing it in the middle. Yes. Um, and it was, it was before laptops, so it was like that, that private eye cartoon, new technology baffles pissed old hat. <laughs> uh, and the only people who had laptops were the people from the tabloids because they had more money. And so there would always be a proper hardcore, you know, old school tabloid hack. Um, and they, the machine was a Tandy, and it filed copy when you hung up the phone. So they'd, they'd type it like this, and they would smoke and they'd go, Roy, I'm, I'm filing the copy now. And they'd hang it up, and that was supposed to transmit it. But because they didn't know what they were doing, they would always cough it up. So they'd hang up the phone and go, fuck! <laughs> and the copy would disappear from their screens, and they'd have to start rewriting it again while picking up the thing. And go, hello, the copy, you didn't get that, did you? you know. and, um, and then, because we used the same phone, so I'd always have to wait for them to go through that and then go through and dictate the thing. Yes. And um, that, you know, because they'd be writing tabloid copy, and then I, because I was writing for the Sunday Correspondent and then the Guardian, and then I come on the phone and say, well, was it Proust who wrote that? You know? <laughs> uh, and, um, you know, writing these really crap, over-literary uh, match reports within 15 minutes. And that, that slightly burnt me out. I've never felt the same about football since. And was that because you weren't seeing it or because you had to analyse it? It was just the stress of the, the, the um, doing it under the deadline and kind of over-watching it. Because yes. you had to concentrate so hard while you were watching it but, well, but, you, uh, but you've had a kind of you write about things you like yes. a lot well I've, I've stopped doing things that I like writing about because it depends what you're writing about like if, you, if you're reviewing a gig if you're doing an on the night gig like something that's published the morning after um, a, review, a review that often means that you have to write the review again kind of like 10 minutes into the gig so often it's you know you just basically right. have to be psychic you just kind of go I will shake my magic eight ball and decide the rest of this gig will be poor okay <laughs> the first 10 minutes were really good I'm surprised okay um <laughs> And, uh, and the worst, I think the night that I decided I was going to stop writing about music was when uh, Madonna was playing Coco for, um, uh, in Camden for uh, Confessions on a Dance Floor, which is a brilliant album that I love. And I was very excited to see Madonna. Um, but because it's Madonna, she came on very, very late to the point where I think I'd seen six and a half minutes of her gig before I had to sit down on the floor with my laptop and start writing it. And that was already quite stressful. Yeah. But then um, uh, Radio 1 DJ, or former Radio 1 DJ, Chris Evans, um, who'd had a couple of drinks, just kind of fell backwards on top of me and snapped the screen off my laptop. And it was hanging by three wires. And I had nine minutes left before my deadline. And I had to sit there holding the screen between my feet like this whilst typing on it. Um, and the adrenaline shot that I got at that point just made me think I need to give this up now. Yeah. So, but it's, I mean, it's funny that kind of like with the way that you have to file stuff, that often the person who's there supposedly reporting on something um, is the one person who isn't actually watching it because they're either kind of working out what their clever thought is or they've already run the backstage and go and file it. Um, so, yeah, so, so we're not very reliable. I don't know if you knew this about journalists, but often we're not very reliable. Yeah. We have to we sometimes have to make stuff up or dream how it might be in the future mm -hmm. and just take a guess. And, but do you like telly less for having to write about it? I no, mean, has I it love changed it your relationship with telly? No, oh God, no. It makes me love it even more, kind of, because I just really sort of, because since I've been, I've been a TV critic for, oh Christ, now how long? Probably thir 13 years, sounds about right. Um, uh, 
because I've got to know people who are making TV, you realise how against the odds is that any television ever is made. Like, and when you're watching it, you know, it's very easy to just sort of sit there, be an armchair worry and go, well, this yeah. is terrible, I would have done it differently. And then when you've been on a couple of sets and you realise that it's such a collaborative effort, and at any point in something where there are 200 people involved in the show, just one of those people having a lacklustre day could ruin it for everybody else. Um, and how incredible the odds are that, it's, you know, stuff ever appears on screen that, you know, is ever really good and isn't completely screwed up. You just have a, a whole new appreciation for it. So, um, and also, you know, the experience becomes more visceral because I get to go on the set of, say, Sherlock and sniff Sherlock's pillows. And that, that helps enormously with the watching of the series subsequently, I find. Um, is that a Benedict Cumberbatch thing or is that all Sherlock? No, I wouldn't want to touch Russell, Basil Rothbone's, <laughs> Rothbone's pillows. Ugh. I imagine they're co covered in some kind of pomade. Um, <laughs> I don't think I'd find that very savoury. Um, yeah, no, Benedict Cumberbatch, oh, that, was, that was pleasant. Although, again, meeting kind of the people that you, meeting people that you fancy, people that you've, I've been quite effusive about how much I fancy Benedict Cumberbatch. Well, we should do the deep questions in a minute, shouldn't we? Oh, yeah, because yeah, this we'll has just been me talking about Jedward and Benedict Cumberbatch. We have got deep questions. Um, are, it kind of ruins it because you talk to them. First of all, if you've written loads of very effusive things about how much you fancy someone, that first moment of contact when you go in yeah, to interview yeah. them is very, very awkward. Um, and I usually try and mitigate it by going, I made it all up, I think you're awful. Um, <laughs> but they tend to see through that. Um, and then secondly, they tell you things that break your heart. Like when yeah. I interviewed Benedict Cumberbatch, he uh, revealed that he's uh, naturally blonde and that he prefers his hair to be blonde and short and that he thinks his Sherlock hair makes him look like a girl. And at that point where it's like, if you don't fancy yourself as Sherlock, then I can't now. Um, and so that kind of ruined it for about nine minutes. <laughs> yeah. I'm amazed that he's naturally blonde. I didn't know that. He's going off to America to be a Star Trek villain. Yeah, he's going to be amazing as a Star Trek villain. I'm very excited about that. The Star Trek thing that we were talking about earlier, about yes. the, the very long time frame. Yes, what you did if you ruled the world. Sorry, I just yes. reminded myself. Is that, and, uh, you know, I, I, I was semi-joking about Star Trek world, but it's actually really in interesting, too, to think about, you know, there's no money in Star Trek world. No. And that was a conscious thing when Gene Roddenberry started it. And there is kind of a strong utopian aspect to this world when uh, all people are doing is trying to discover things and yes. be happy. And it's a bit like being at university on a full grant, isn't it, I guess? Except with <laughs> you know, just learning things. Interplanetary travel. Yes. Um, and th that's the thing that I think, you know, thinking about the very long time frames is actually interesting to think that if we're, if we're heading for that world, because if, if we're around in, I mean, there's another project called The Clock of the Long Now, whose time frame is... 10,000 years, they build a clock that runs for 10,000 years. And to do that, you have to assume, you have to build a clock that functions without electricity. Yes. And that will keep working under all circumstances, and it's in California, so it works. Is it one of those ones that's plugged into a huge potato? And I've all seen all those in the archives. You have to do all the, prevent all those things from happening. So you have to think about, that's like twice as long as we've been around since the existence of writing. And if you think about what the world will be like in that time, it has to be a much better place than this. Yes. Well, just the way that things have progressed so much. I mean, I always find it really weird. It seems to be sort of like, I don't know, particularly middle-class thing. I'm sure I'll rant on more about class later. But, but just this idea that there was a sort of good old days and we should sort of think that there was a gentler period kind of maybe 50 years ago where everybody just had a duck pond and could leave their doors open. The idea of leaving your door open, why that's a utopian vision, I don't know. It's just letting a draft in. Um, uh, and just this idea that kind of, you know, things have just suddenly gone downhill since people started having hoodies and going on the internet. Um, I mean, just palpably for nearly everybody I know, things have got better. So we've, we've progressed so much in such a short amount of time. Things like people go on about political correctness. Just the idea that we kind of almost kind of came up with a law about being polite to each other, yeah. I think is so lovely. That's such an amazing piece of admin that we did and it made things so much better. Because instead of going, I feel really upset and insulted and will probably be, you know, in some way stunted for the rest of my life that you've gone around calling me, you know, Packy or Dyke or whatever, you can say, that's actually an impolite and horrible thing to do. And, the, you know, I, I love the idea of political correctness. We've just done so much admin already. If you think about, I was watching, I've got to uh, the, I had to review this week um, a documentary about Michael Jackson. Spike Lee did this uh, documentary called Bad 25, to mark 25 years of, um, of, uh, of Bad by Michael Jackson. And, um, and there was a really great quote in it. They were talking about, obviously, all these 
terrible things that Michael Jackson did and how so many mistakes that he made and sort of awful things that he did, but also it was also the sort of battle about the fact that he was an amazing artist. And someone was going, we'll probably never have an artist that good, that amazing at dancing, that incredible at kind of making iconic videos, that incredible at singing and songwriting, <laughs> because the circumstances that made Michael Jackson would be illegal now. Mm. You would not be able to put your child on the road at five and brutally beat him with a belt. Mm. You know, and that is partially what made him such a great artist. His dad would sit there with his belt on his lap watching him sing, mm. and if he didn't sing his heart out, which you can hear he does on ABC and Rockin' Robin and stuff, it's amazing, mm. um, then, then he would be beaten. And you know, so you're never gonna get anybody who's gonna sing that impassionedly again, because it's very unlikely, because it would just simply be illegal to have that kind of childhood. Now, even when we started finding out all, all these awful things about Michael Jackson, people would still think that, that was a fairly normal childhood. You know, people sort of got hit when I was a kid, you know, sort of kids would run out and worked and stuff. But now we know that to be incorrect, and that's happened in such a short period of time. So. I'm resolutely optimistic if we've managed to do this much admin in terms of making people generally sane in the last hundred years, in a thousand years or ten thousand years. Um, you know, I think it will be even. I, I would hazard guess it will be even better than Star Trek because uh, I found the character of Geordie quite annoying, and uh, I would hope that he would not be in it. <laughs> mm. Yes, he is really annoying. Uh, but there's, I mean, I think it's an interesting idea politically because if you think about what that world would be like in terms of equalities and opportunities, and you know. The things we should do now are the things that make this world more, more like that world. It's yes. that wonderful thing that um, Obama quotes, that his favorite saying is one of Martin, Le Martin Luther King's, that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Well, that's, that's comforting. That's a really wonderful idea. That's enormously comforting. And just another reason to fancy Barack Obama, that he just casually quotes that kind of thing. Exactly. Do you think he still smokes? I do reckon you know? he does. You would if you were the president, wouldn't you? You'd be like... But he can't smoke in the White House because it's a federal building. I bet there's balconies. Yeah. There's no way. And if there aren't, he'll have had one built. I, um, I did this thing a couple of weeks ago where I did a charity thing, and I was there early, and the first two people who were there were Sarah Brown and Gordon Brown, and uh, had the weird and discombobulating thing of uh, the former prime minister coming over and taking my 25-pound Topshot duffel coat and handing me a glass of champagne, and then engaging me in small talk because no one else was there. And, uh, and he was really lovely, and he seemed very cheerful and very happy, and he told me a series of amazing stories about world leaders that he's known, um, including the fact that uh, it's apparently key that when you're, uh, you're hosting Nelson Mandela that you always make sure that you've got a bottle of Cuban rum in the house because that's, that's all that Nelson Mandela will drink because um, the way that Che Guevara helped the anti-apartheid movement was apparently always making sure there was a steady supply of Cuban rum being smuggled into Robben Island. And this is, <laughs> as a world leader, you know this fact about Mandela. And then he told a story about Barack Obama and kind of, he told a couple of stories about Barack Obama and kind of how he'd had to choose a correct president to give Barack Obama when he was elected as president. And, um, and during this conversation, I was really enjoying it, but I was also aware that when he got to the end of this really brilliant cycle of amazing stories about world leaders, but I didn't really have any anecdotes of my own about any world leaders that I'd ever hung out with. And was just trying to think of any kind of world leader related conversation that I could carry on with. Waited until he stopped, paused, we both took a sip of our champagne and went, so, do you think Bill Clinton's lost too much weight now? Um, <laughs> I liked him better when he was big dog. And, uh, and uh, Gordon just stared at me and just went, well, he had to have heart surgery, didn't he? And that's probably why. <laughs> and at that point, I realised I'm not really cut out for talking to us prime ministers. I don't really, I really have. And then I told him my Jedward story, and it was all okay. But <laughs> up until that point, I was struggling. <laughs> I sat, I sat next to Harriet Harman at something, and said, um, and it was the day after. You, I've never met, I've never met any political big shot before. And but um, it was the day after the American elections, and I said, well, I'm completely knackered because I stayed up. It was riveting. Did, did you stay up? And she very gently said, um, no, I had to do Prime Minister's questions today. <laughs> so that made me owned. I bet in her head, though, she was going, owned. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just or reminded pwned, you. Pwned, yeah. <laughs> um, Should we do more? Oh, go on, go yeah, on. No, you were thinking. But one thing about that long time frame, though, it's, it's interesting how we don't think about life having improved. You know, because it's an amazing thing and all the stuff about the wealth, you know, not being able to afford welfare state things. I think it should be the an, a much better known thing that when the state pension came in for men at 65, the average life expectancy was 64. Yes. And that's only 50 years ago. No. M most men, I mean, the reason it was constructed like that, most men died, most men died before the pension age. 
And in Vietnam, it was 19. I, I know that's a, yes. So exactly. Quoting and you know, that's an astonishing amount of progress in a yes. very short, in, in, you know, one lifespan. But I think that's the job of arts and culture in the same way that I think so many of the sort of reasons that feminism might have tanked off in the last 20 years. It's not just simply down to academic feminism. You needed to have, you know, feminist ideals embodied in books and in culture and in films and in pop. And that's you know, the job of artists to be doing that. In the same way, things like the welfare state and social progress, you know, if we like these things, those are the things that we need to be writing about, you know, and that, that's what you do so brilliantly. You know, you do that Dickens thing of, of taking something that's happening culturally and just put, novelizing it and turning it into characters, uh, which is by far the best way to learn those things. And it's been interesting seeing places that have done that, like Call the Midwife, which was such a big hit on BBC Two last year. Every week they'll have a bit where they just go, well, thank goodness the NHS was invented 25 minutes ago, or this woman would have died. It's kind of like, this baby is here because of the aegis of good old Nye Bevin. Thank goodness for the NHS. I'm so glad it's been invented. Um, but that's the kind of thing you need because, you know, obviously because, you know, these are the, these, you know, the folk tale of what life was like before the welfare state is something that needs to be carried on. And like, you know, I had my nan talking about being in a pre-welfare state with, oh God, how many kids do you have? She had nine. And when you'd get a knock on the door from the debt collector, you'd have to take what bits of furniture you had, go out into the back garden and pass them over to the next door neighbor's back garden so that when they came in, because if you had any furniture that could be sold, they wouldn't give you your parish handout. You know, even if you had a chair, they would not give you money for bread, even though you had nine starving children. Um, so, you know, that, you know, those are the, you know, and if it, once we're now of an age where you're not getting living relatives who can remind you about how awful it was before we had welfare, then you do get this complacency and people just, you know, people smugly thinking, well, welfare's for other people, but not for me, or it's those people over there who need it. But one third of the people in this country claim some kind of form of benefit, which is why it's so bizarre when you see it written about as something that kind of welfare's happening over there to the welfare people. We're a third of the country. I, I still find it nuts that, you know, I, I don't read any writers on the, on the national press who can speak from, uh, well, the benefits that I claim or here is what my life is like on benefits. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, yes, I mean, that's, you know, that's why, you know, it's sort of, if anybody's writing anything, I think that's something you really need to bear in mind. I think that's, you know, a, a massive social need that you need to address because otherwise we're just going to complacency ourselves back into the Middle Ages. Yeah, I always think it's an interesting... British Rail was an exa interesting example of that. And of a, of a of slight structural problem with Britain, which is that we we do love um, not complaining in the sense of directing specific grievances at something that's gone wrong, but mm -hmm. we love moaning. Mm. And and British Rail had become you know a, everyone's favourite thing to moan about. We thought, oh, it's shit, it doesn't work, it's useless, blah blah blah. My, and that allowed the government to privatise it, yes. so that they can break it up. And um, in fact, British Rail was fantastic. And it, it costs us more this way. You know, we, we kind of moaned ourselves into an astonishing thing where the government could break this thing, end up being more expensive, just because we didn't appreciate the fact that actually, in fact, British Rail in the 80s was great. Well, I think that's what's going to happen with the BBC now. Uh, you know, that's, again, just people constantly complaining about this stuff. It's just very important to keep going. You know, if you go anywhere else in the world and talk to people about the BBC, they're like, they just presume that we love it. I mean, so you go, oh, no, we think it's rubbish. They just are like, oh, how can you say that? It's like we've got the world's only dragon, and we moan about it all the time because it's just a bit smoky. And just kind of you go, broad, like, but you've got the only dragon in the world. And it's, and it's one of those things, again, that is just not going to get reinvented. Like, yeah. if it gets smashed to bits, if every time it's weakened by one of these scandals, like... All the stuff that happened with the Jimmy Savile thing I thought was absolutely amazing. They were acting as if Newsnight had abused children. They completely forgot because Jimmy Savile wasn't there. The, em the emotion that was done behind it, people not thinking it through. It was like Newsnight had to be punished for these things that had happened 40 years ago. It's one programme. You know, it, it, it's the BBC. It's a huge organisation. Within all of that, when they're having a go at Newsnight and the BBC, I didn't see anybody going, well, what about the fact that he was given a flat in, in two hospitals and a prison? You know, let, let, let's now look at, at, at breaking apart those systems. It was just all the, the, all the opprobrium fell on the BBC in a really illogical and... But I think it's that thing of, you know, once the BBC's been bullied a couple of times, then it's just so much easier to turn around and blame it again. Which is why I think it should be kidnapped by a pirate king. I think some kind of swaggering pirate king needs to literally board the BBC and take it over. And just, and just sort of go, ah, commercial television, ah, I don't care. And just do, and just have the balls to crack on with it and not be constantly cowering. I think, I think they tried that. He was called Greg Dyke. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> are, you, are you bullish about the, you know, the, the current framework for the media? Because in, in, in terms of both our working lives, papers have been kind of the frame for that. Yes. 
uh, uh, I've got a friend who, um, whose daughter has just turned 18 and was applying for universities, and so they were having the, you know, you can't really have that what do you want to do conversation when they're cross and teenage, but she's just starting to emerge from that. And so I said to her daughter, you know, what, what, are, what are you thinking about doing afterwards? To which her daughter said, well, the thing I'd really like to do is be a journalist. To which my friend said, but darling, that's like wanting to be a weaver. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, it's uh, true. Is, uh, <laughs> I mean, is, is yes. that what you think? No, well, I've, I've jokingly spent the last three years to all my journalist friends going, we're miners in 1984. It's, you know, it, it's a dying industry. And I, I, I'm enormously gloomy about the immediate future. Um, of the press, uh, because there just isn't any money. I mean, you just look every, you know, the, the, the only newspapers that are making money are the Daily Mail, and that is simply because they have the massive sidebar of shame of pictures of girls' fat legs yeah. um, that's driving a worldwide industry of prurience well, so and hatefulness. enjoying her curves, that's a good yes, one. Yes, pouring her curves into, yes, enjoying her curves. Flaunting her curves. No, she's just walking. That's not... <laughs> she's... She's just walking. She's being photographed at an unflattering angle yes. while walking. <laughs> yeah. Pouring your curves into it, it's a pair of trousers. It's, you can't, there's no pouring action in trousers. Um, unless <laughs> things have gone very wrong. Um, uh, yes, I mean, so that's, you know, that's what, you know, it, that, that's what currently will, is the only things that will earn revenue. But, being an eternal optimist, and also because I now have this thousand year overview of time since I came here. Um, uh, I, I just think it's one of those ideas that would just get reinvented again. Like for instance, vinyl, you know, for the last 20 years, kind of like, you know, vinyl, things just stopped being issued on vinyl, they've just gone. I only know about this because my husband's a massive vinyl collector, but that's one of the very few um, areas of the industry that's actually grown in the last couple of years, and it's one of the few areas of uh, the industry that as a band you can guarantee to earn money because you just have to buy it. Um, and there's a great roaring second-hand trade for, this for it as well, and it's just an enduring concept that even though it looked like it went away for a bit, has now come back, and there are pressing plants opening in this country now, um, mainly to fuel my husband's desire for this stuff. But I think other people are buying it as well. And I think the same is with journalism, just the idea of... Because the thing is, at the moment, everyone's kind of like, oh, they're a bit hog-wild and drunk on, like, all the free blogs and all the free stuff, and yeah. I mean, just read an endless amount of free blogs. And I think once you've read an endless amount of free blogs by people because they don't have any experience ramble on for 3,000 words and don't have a point and haven't been fact-checked and they don't have access to the people that they're talking about and don't have any inside information, you might start to crave something that, you know, sort of revert back to a former model. That's my hope. But what are we talking about in terms of time? Because in their existing form, you know, I don't know about your mates, but talking to mine, it usually comes down to, you know, whether you give the papers, you know, two, three, five, or... T I mean, nobody gives them 10 years. Yes, no, time. everyone's very gloomily gone, it'll be four years and it'll all be over. But, I mean, I have been having, hearing about that, about the independent for the last 20 years. So, yeah. um, no, I mean, I suspect, I suspect that the industry might hive off into different directions for a bit. Because, for instance, if you're a columnist, like, you know, say Charlie Brooker, you know, he could cede independence from The Guardian, given the amount of followers that he's got and the amount of fans that he's got. And if the, you know, if you had other writers like that, you could form a website somewhere where you just simply had columnists and they would get a cut of the advertising revenue and they're all people who can drive enough traffic there through Twitter, so they're known. But then what you're doing there is you're breaking up the whole idea of newspapers where you have columnists and news and sport, which is what works so well because, you know, at the moment, columnists are subsidising people in Syria who cost £200,000 a year to be out there because they need bodyguards. So... So you do need it all to work together as a whole, but one of the things, one of the ideas that I've heard mentioned a lot would be the idea that there would, you would just break, basically break up newspapers in the same way that you break up in any industry, and you, you sell the parts for scrap and separate it all out. But would, the thing that I think that we might miss, I mean, uh, this is a question rather, rather than a statement, is that thing about the kind of, the place where those conversations happen. You know, because yes. you can have any conversation you like, on the net, and you can find people who are interested in the same thing as you. I, I was very struck by the, by the Republicans being amazed at losing. Yes. I, I th there was something <laughs> yeah. really, there was something really re re revealing about that, and it, and it shows that how you know, people can af effectively create their own reality in terms yes. of who they listen to, what they, how they choose to filter what's coming in. And presumably a, a world in a world without that kind of gathering together function that papers have would be one in which basically we, you know, we, and that, that metaphor that's everywhere at the moment about curation. Yes. People curate the stuff they already want to hear and yes. already are they're interested. But, but you don't have that kind of 
echo chamber and the place where sort of societies talk to themselves. Well, I suppose it's communal spaces, isn't it? And what you've noticed over the last 50 years is kind of an erosion of, of communal spaces, like, for instance, libraries. Like, I've written a lot about libraries and are very passionate about those because just the symbolism of having somewhere that you can go that isn't a shop where you're supposed to spend, spend money and it's not your house where things could be horrible, but there's a third place where you can go where you don't spend money and you've got shelter and there are amusing things there. And, you know, and, and, and they want you to be there, too. That's yes. an important part of it. You they know, they really want you to be there, yeah. Um, mainly for the body warmth, because they have to turn the radiators off for four hours a day. But yes, so it's just the idea of like communal spaces. And I don't know, if I go to the South Bank in London, just the idea that they built this place that's often empty, that if you've got toddlers, they can walk around in and stroll around in. And the idea of, you know, it's like this brilliant souped up post-war town hall that everyone can go to and take part in and have somewhere to go. And no one's building any areas like that now. Now you're just supposed to go to the shopping mall. You just go and hang out at the shops instead. And culturally, so I mean, that's physically, and then culturally you have the same thing. This is kind of loss of, of communal areas. But I guess that's because, I mean, I never really see progress as being completely linear and just going from one place to the other. These things come around in circles. So I think we're at the, sort of at the end point of an experiment now where everybody can go off and do their own thing because we discovered the internet and you can go... I'm really into uh, dressing sheep up as politicians, and I've never met anybody who's like that. And you go on the internet and you type it in, and you're like, wow, there are five other people who are really into that. And you find your little group and you can hang out with them. Um, so, you know, and that's, and that's one of the reasons why it's or, brilliant. Or indeed the bloke who's, who's deeply held the most you know, lovingly nurtured sexual fantasy was about being killed and eaten. Yes. Do you remember that thing in Germany? I thought there was something very, you know, post internet about that, because before that he'd have. You know, presumably he's been on, on his own in his bed sick. You know, no one will eat me. Wanking himself. How can I find? Him, you know, how can I find someone to, to eat me? You know, yes. But he managed to find that person. I'd love to find, see how many times he tried to start that conversation in social yeah. environments, <laughs> maybe at work, maybe in a shop, yeah. on a bus. Just <laughs> have, have, have one. Have one more <laughs> glass of white wine. There's something I'd like to run by you. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Do you want to come back for a coffee or maybe my leg? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Or uh, chop my todger off and then kill me. <laughs> yeah, which is what I have heard that before, but yes, yeah. no. <laughs> um, uh, no, when you, when you said kind of specific um, uh, sexual fantasies, my one for always that is finding out, reading out a man, about a man whose thing was um, having a black plastic bin liner put over his head. Um, he, could only, he could only orgasm if he had a black plastic... I bet Doris Lessing never told this story. Um, having a black plastic bin liner put over his head and he could only orgasm if there was a bird released in there and the bird was beating his face with its wings uh, while, while he pleasured himself. And it was one of those things, again, where you just sort of go, but how did you find that out? How did you... What was the big day where you were like, sex isn't working for me? Oh! Right, now this is how you do it. And I could only presume in the end, and I did spend a lot of time thinking about it, that it must have been when he was cleaning out his nan's budgie cage oh, and yeah. just the budgie attacked him. I couldn't think of any other way where you'd have the bird in close contact with your It head. has a Norman Bates cleaning out the budgie cage vibe, I yes. agree. Yes. I, I couldn't see how the masturbation fitted in, but I the cracked the bird thing I felt at that point. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, that sort of slightly feeds a theory of mine that there's every single sexual fantasy and deviation and permutation in the world that can exist, does exist, except with one thing, the only thing that it doesn't feature. There's every sort of permutation, you know, medical problem, everything. But there's, there, nobody has fantasies involving snot. <laughs> it's, the, uh, it's the only thing that never comes up. No. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> uh, uh, no. Um, in terms of these, um, sorry, I just, I've been thinking about that for years. <laughs> I, I, have to get, uh, I feel a lot better, actually. Um, in terms of, you know, what's a, a, a genuine collective, a collective space of the good kind, like a library or a kind of... Well, yes. Which is Twitter? Is Twitter the good kind of space or, or the other one, or a kind of hybrid? Well, I mean, I suppose the good thing about Twitter is that, I mean, I treat it because I work from home as kind of basically like a massive cheers in the sky where I can kind of walk in and be norm at any point. I've kind of got, got my mates there. So, like, if you're sort of alone on a bus stop at night, you can just kind of turn it on and, like, you're never alone. And you sort of, especially if you've got kids and you work quite hard, it means you can fit your socialising in. I mean, many of my friends are distressed to find out that I fit most of my Twitter socialising in when I'm on the toilet. I mean, for me you know, a two or three minute long poo is enough time to just catch up with everybody and then on with the working day, but it's... Is there, you know, I, I probably shouldn't ask this, but is there some way you can tell the ones that are done on the loo? Are they like... Well, I often very cheerfully go, icon? I'm on the loo before oh, I start. Okay. So, I mean, I'm, I'm quite sherry in that way. Um, mm. But, I mean, I, I mean, for me, I think it's a souped-up souped version of reality because 
you know, in the normal world, if someone's being horrible to you, there's not that much you can do about it. Whereas yeah. if, on, you know, people go on about people trolling you on Twitter, and I've had some very bad days on Twitter, but the one thing that you can do on Twitter that you can't do in real life is just press block. Yeah. And they go away in a way that you can't do in normal life. And I find it particularly pleasing that when you're blocking someone, do you imagine that you're crushing their head going, I block you, I block you, I block you, and then they die. And um, <laughs> that, that can really get you through quite a bad day. Um, so, 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 so it's I love a connection it. thing. It's a way of... Yes, and also uh, that's my news source. That's how I find out about everything happening first. So it's like, if it, to me, it feels like I'm standing next to the waterfall of the world, sort of falling by, and kind of if there's anything happening, like the flood has brought it all down downstream, and it's all just coming past me now on the waterfall. And so if anything's happening, then um, it will fall past me on Twitter if I sit there long enough. But you, you're not on Twitter, are you? No, I don't. I mean, I'm slightly, I'm fascinated by it, um, and I used to look at it a lot, and then re thought actually there's something creepy about looking at it without actually tweeting. So, uh, so I stopped. You're a Twitter voyeur. Well, a, or a lurker, is that what they call it? Yes. And, um, but I, I did completely stop because of that feeling that it, it was, it's a sort of funny semi-private space, even though people don't, tr don't treat it as one. And somehow you kind of, um, I don't know, I felt it crosses a kind of, there's an intimacy line it slightly crosses tweeting. That's Not always my favourite kind of area life. to work in, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> but the thing that, I noticed that you do that. Is it technically very? You, your personality comes across very vividly in Twitter, which most people's doesn't. I think that's just block capitals, love. I don't think there's anything more. <laughs> just no, literally prefacing everything. We scream. No, trust me. I'm on it, the toilet, and then that. No, it's not. Trust me. I mean, it's 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 very striking. And you know, some people who come through very vividly on Twitter, just formally and technically, I think it's a really striking medium. And there are people who, in some sense, can't write who are incredibly vivid on Twitter. Kanye West. Yes. There's a, you know, his Twitter, he, I think my single favourite ever tweet, because it's, like it's like a whole movie, uh, is, is when he wrote, yo, I'm in Dubai, man. <laughs> yeah. Th this shit be fucked up. <laughs> and I can, you can sort of, you can, see the, you can see the penthouse, you know. He's looking out the window. He can't remember why he booked the gig, you know, who booked it for. He can't even why he's there, you know. The, there's a ring at the door, the room service has brought up a bottle of Cristal, and he genuinely, in the moment, is thinking, yo, I'm in Dubai, man, this shit be fucked up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's Celebrities on Twitter, though, is amazing. There, there must be so many people who are just... I mean, Rupert Murdoch on Twitter is amazing. That, that first... They've only been on there for a week, and the first, one of the six things, the six things that he tweeted was, Louise Mensch. And he obviously thought he was confused with Google and was looking for her, but just tweeted <laughs> her name after <laughs> it. And everyone was like, hmm, I wonder if Louise is going to get an offer from the sun anytime soon to work for them. Oh, she has. Right, OK. Now I'm psychic. Um, so that's always fun. Um, people who are on there drunk, uh, drunk, drunk celebrities on Twitter is always a, a, an incredible thing. Or, um, or just or suddenly, um, uh, obviously, having some kind of promo alarm going off or, or a suitability alarm. For instance, when uh, uh, P. Diddy stroke, Puff Daddy stroke, whatever he is this week, um, was at the, um, uh, when it was the memorial service for Michael Jackson, he tweeted very movingly about what a terrible day it was and how much he missed the King of Pop and stuff. But if you went back through his timeline, just four hours before it had been a massive party, just going, mmm, Pop-Tarts are the bomb! <laughs> and um, obviously was still drunk as he was tweeting through the sadness of Michael Jackson's funeral. My very favourite tweet ever was from uh, Jedward, who appeared to be a recurring trope, in a way that I bet they weren't for Doris Lessing, um, uh, who uh, tweeted, uh, John tweeted, um, Edwards just knocked his bowl off the table and Cocoa Pops have gone everywhere. But he mistyped the word bowl so that he spelt it B-O-W-E-L. <laughs> <laughs> At which point it's such a frightening image. And then also, and they'll tweet things like, we're in a wardrobe and just leave it at that, and just the idea of the people just sitting in a wardrobe, and they never really specify which one's which. Yeah. And, um, yeah, no, they're, 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 no uh, for, that, for that kind of thing, unmediated celebrity tweeting, I think, is an amazing thing to watch. Do you think any of them have, like, a PPE... I have this image that some of them, especially some of the footballers, they actually have a PPE graduate, like, chained up in the basement, yes. you know, <laughs> writing kind of philosophical and Nietzsche-related tweets. <laughs> Are you referring to Joey Barton here by any well, chance? Yeah, might be, yeah. Yeah. Joey Barton's been amazing on Twitter. He's been such value for money. After he did, I don't know if anybody saw it, but he did an amazing press conference last week where he kind of talked in a, talked in a French accent, <laughs> thinking that that was actually being able to speak French, which is he, he had, he, a mistake many nine-year-olds made. He had but, some French syntax as well, though. Yes. Remember, I make a pass of uh, 50 metres. Yes, 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 yes. 
that whole ocean thing as well. It's an ocean of difference. Um, and, uh, and so loads of people took the piss out of him on Twitter. And then the next morning, he just opened up his Twitter account with good moaning, which is the, uh, <laughs> the traditional Very greeting good. of the, uh, the policeman who are uh, on LOLO. LO. So, um, so he was good for that. He was a good sport for that. So I appreciate that. But it's funny because with the Levison thing, loads of people have talked about how you will police Twitter, whether you can... Again, it's kind of like, what is Twitter? And kind of a sort of bigger conversation about what is the internet? People are going, can you libel people on Twitter if your Sally Burkow, for instance, went on there and kind of went, I wonder why everyone's talking about Lord McAlpine and now she's being sued. And it's like, is that a libel? What would have happened if she'd done that in a newspaper? How do we regulate that? And the first thing with that is that and people are confusing it with newspapers and magazines and television. It's not a publication. There is no overseer. This stuff isn't vetted. Whatever the laws of libel are for gathering in a public space, they, that is what, because Twitter is just a massive public space. So basically, whatever, so what, whatever the implications of, and also because people are anonymous as well often and have sort of fake names. So Twitter's basically a massive masquerade ball. And so whatever the implications would be of standing up dressed as a stag and shouting something very libelous um, at a massive ball, then that should be the implications on Twitter. It seems to be a, a, a simple logic to me, but people, because it's the internet, seem to think it's different. Like, it's not something that was created by humans where human beings communicate. And I was trying to work out what this was, and I suddenly thought yesterday, it's because they get it confused with computer games. They kind of, they, they genuinely think if you're on the computer that it's like, I don't know, you, you're, you know, Twitter is like World of Warcraft, that people on there are saying things that they don't mean, and, you know, so therefore it shouldn't matter. And uh, it's not. It's, it's human beings and the things that humans invented saying things that, you know, there should be consequences for. It's not a made-up game. It's not a fantasy world. It's not a dream. Um, it's still the same rules of humanity that we have everywhere else. And it's brought, well, it, effectively what it's brought back is slander. And because slander's gone away as a thing, people have forgotten that slander was a really important crime. If you lived in a, in a closed community or a village, you know, going around saying, you know, evil fibs about people, that was really, really important and toxic. Yes. So, you know, Twitter might not be libel, but it can often, often be slander. The other village-like thing about it, though, I mean, it's one of the... It was actually, Kazu Ishiguro first said this to me years ago in conversation. I've thought about it a lot ever since. That that's also village like celebrities are sort of what we have in common now. Yes. You know that they are the sitting next to some total stranger on the bus. I mean, you, you make the joke in your book that you know you've read more about um, uh, Oprah Winfrey's ass than about the economic rise of China. Yes. But in a funny way, you know. Uh, we, Oprah Winfrey is something we have in common yes. with, with that stranger who probably doesn't know or care anything about the economic rise of China. But you can have a conversation about, about Jedward or about you know, the right-hand bar of shame in the Daily Mail. Yes. And, in, and, it, and it's a sort of... I can't tell whether that's a sort of a melancholy thing or, or actually it's incredibly precious because it's the last thing we have in common. Oh, no, I think, it's, I, I think celebrity culture is so hugely underestimated and devalued. I mean, one thing that really alarms me is, okay, I mean, there's a million reasons why celebrity culture is really important. First of all, because it gives us something in common and in a world where we travel more now, we meet more people, you know, sort of, again, 100 years ago, you might meet 20 people in your life and now we're just meeting people all the time and going off to different places and introducing ourselves to people. Um, you know, you know, just going to the hairdressers and then going abroad on a holiday and being on a bus, you're meeting more people than, you know, my grandparents would ever have met. So you need to have things that are in common, and that's what celebrities are there for. You know, they're archetypes. They allow us to work through anxieties and fears if you see these kind of recurring tropes, particularly for women, I think, it's sort of with, again, with the sort of failure of there being many different female role models in, in popular culture, in, in art and novels and movies. Just, you know, the fact that we've got celebrity women there that we can kind of examine our different fears about body dysmorphia or being a single parent or alcohol addiction or being, you know, repeatedly married or whatever. We sort of, we can debate these things there. Um, and, uh, and one of the things that really saddens me is that, and, and also celebrity culture is so massive, it drives newspaper sales. It's one of the few things that, that might you know, still keep the press afloat in this country for good or for evil. You know, it's a massive, it dictates um, tabloid agenda, it dictates news agenda to a massive amount. You know, tomorrow, every single paper and tonight, every single news programme will be full of the fact that Kate and William are having a baby. And that's, you know, that, that's celebrity, that's gossip. So given all of this, if anybody didn't know, yes, hurrah, a new heir, has, a new heir is coming to us, hurrah. Um, and um, uh, uh, so the fact that it's only left in the hands of kind of, of, of unkind-minded idiots really saddens me that celebrity culture is only written about by, you know, OK and Heat um, and, and, okay and um, Hello. Um, 
and talked about in those terms because I think you know you need someone who's got like first of all some humanity and secondly a bit of intelligence to be able to go oh, you know this is an interesting phenomenon that we have here or what would the implications be of this rather than it always just being someone going well she's sweaty she's fat she couldn't hold it together and um, so yeah so you know uh, that, that, that's something that I would like to see a bit more brain power to, you know and, and just sort of people treating it with the importance that it deserves. It is an important course, it's an important thing. You can't pretend it's not important. It's massive. It's what the majority of conversations are at the moment. But, but it, it's, there's a kind of, I think we're gonna have to stop in a minute. Or in oh no, but we didn't do any of the deep questions. Look, I filled a hat oh, no, full of deep questions. Oh, and my the comb hat. in case I needed to back comb. The hat of deepness. Yes. Um, <laughs> but there's, a, there's an, an irony, isn't there, about the fact that the, it's the, the most ephemeral thing is actually the thing that we, is that the most effective social glue at the moment. You know, that's the thing that, well, because, because it feels inclusive, doesn't it? Mm. I mean, with something like that, y y anybody feels that they can dip in. You know, you can start having a conversation about any of those things, so you're not being put off by the fact that you feel you have to spend 20 years studying celebrity culture. Although it does help if you're trying to work out who the Kardashians are. You need to be able to look at the whole family tree, really, to understand that one. Um, but, yeah, no, just feeling that you've got an entry point and a handle on something, I think, sort of feeling that it's accessible which I guess has been one of our recurring themes with Twitter and the internet and the media and stuff, but just feeling that you can join in and you can see yourself and you can find yourself in the world, um, I think is the key thing, seeing a reflection of yourself and something that you recognise. Is that, have we done a really cool summing up thing right on the hour? Yeah, you is this did. literally that in it? Well, thank you. Oh, I don't want it to stop. Yeah, yeah we've done an hour now. This is a really weird thing, there's no real way, you don't, we don't have to, technically we don't have to end this, do we? Yeah. Oh, okay, well tell your, tell your Jedward story. Okay, I'll quickly tell my Jedward story, and then I can go. Actually, it's not that good now, I've had an, an hour-long intro to it. Um, it was basically the unexpected fact that I went to the Children's Baptist last week, and Jed, I was talking to Dick and Dom from Inder Bungalow, and, um, and then Jedward came over, and they went, Catelyn, we love you, we're Jedward. Um, <laughs> it's doubtful anyone in the room didn't know that. And, um, and they were like, oh, we love you, but you've got something stuck in your teeth. And I was like, what? And they were like, something's stuck in your teeth there. And I was like, have I got it? They were like, no. And they were like, there? No, I haven't got it. There? They were like, no, give us your hand. So they took my finger and started trying to get this thing out from between my teeth, but I couldn't get it out. And by this point I thought, because I've written quite a couple of snarky things about Jedward, I was like, this is a massive prank. You're trying to fool me. I was like, there's nothing in my teeth. And they went, no, let's get our Jed phones and show you. <laughs> So they both got their iPhones out and photographed my mouth and showed me my mouth. And sure enough, there was a black sesame seed stuck in there and I just couldn't get it out. So they went, Jedward will get it out. And they both put their hands in my mouth and went like this. <laughs> and started cleaning me with their hands like a little Jedward toothbrush. Um, and it, it, was, it was quite alarming. So I was just kind of like, no, I'm, I'm fine, thanks, lads. And I backed away. And, and then they backflipped in front of me. And I suddenly realised two things. They're very beautiful and they're really quite... I mean, it feels weird to say this but they're quite fit. Um, <laughs> but they're still Jedward. But then for the rest of the evening, every time they looked across at me, the taller, dominant Jedward kept going. <laughs> in a flirty way. And that was what was happening to me that day. I was being flirted at by Jedward. And then I got home and I checked my Twitter and the first DM I had was from, private message DM, was from Jedward going, hello, we love you all all in lowercase, and they've sent me loads of texts and DMs since. Really surreal things like, we're going to buy a toothbrush today. Toothbrushes are smells. I don't know what that means. <laughs> I don't know what that means. I think they want to have sex with me, but I'm not sure. <laughs> so that's my Jedward dilemma. I'm being flirted at in a surreal way by albino twins. That's just what's happened to me today. Well, I think that's a suitably upsetting, disturbing and bizarre note on which to end. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, well, we've, you've solved the problem of who to invite for the 2013 long player conversation. Jedward! <laughs> I, I can see it now. Um, we covered a lot of ground, and thank you so much for um, actually doing something that's very brave, uh, sitting and uh, really just um, with no roadmap. But you took us to an, some extraordinary places, and thank you very much, John. Thank you so much, Catelyn. Let's have another round of applause.